I'd like to say good morning. Today is Wednesday, December 3rd, now 903. Thank you, Father, for the Corporation Committee support. And I have a prayer by Commissioner Clack, followed by a pledge of allegiance from Commissioner Henry. <coughs> Bow your heads, please. Good morning, my Heavenly Father. We assemble here this morning in faith and trust. Help us as we go through the deliberation of today's business. Keep, keep us ever aware that we're here to represent our community and not ourselves. Those who are less fortunate, give them peace and blessings this morning those who are seeking something, help them to find it this morning. Our world is in a turmoil, I ask for peace all around. I ask this in my son's name, amen. 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 <coughs>
ventilation system that when you enter the building past the cats. The smell is unbelievable. The conditions that our present employees have to work underneath. The conditions that we have for a young vet, now she's on, uh, I think she's had her baby, totally pregnant, that she has to work to doctor these animals. The millage was for the, the building. Just to give you an example, I do volunteer. I volunteer for buying <coughs> I volunteer not for the volunteers or the employees or the commissioners. I, the first few meetings that I went to, I saw the conditions and I'm please don't stop me at two minutes, I'll be done very quickly. I saw the conditions of the workers that clean the kennels. These young men, their clothes were all stained. They had urine and pee, I mean urine and poop and bleach all over their basic shoes, their tennis shoes that they are in daily, soaking wet, and they had to work like that. When I looked down, I thought, why don't we have rubber boots? I immediately left, called Commissioner Curtis, and I said, I need boots. I need two pairs of boots. I also asked for rubber aprons. I haven't got them yet, but I know they'll be coming. I know it's two minutes. Your time is up. Thank you. All right. Just this add-on is not fair right now. It's a wage increase for employees, Thank certain you. employees, and it's not fair. Thank you, Mr. Sims. Thank you. Brian Nolan on some black waste money, Avenue um, City of Flint, Michigan. I too sit on the Animal Advisory Subcommittee, and I'm, I was a little taken back because um, I thought we had initially said that when we have meetings, we're going to have them in the, in the evening. Um, this meeting was called the day before Thanksgiving. I had a prior commitment, so I could not come. Um, I had requested the information a couple of days before. I kept it in the runaround um, about getting it. I did receive it after the meeting. I'm a little taken back because when I was uh, emailing um, the director and also on um, one of the commissioners, I was emailed back by one of the commissioners saying that I was trying to micromanage what was going to happen. I'm not trying to micromanage. All I'm trying to do is get good quality information so that I can make an informed decision about moving forward or how I was going to um, um, vote um, with this. I found out that uh, the presentation that was presented um, they accepted it, which is fine. Um, my concern is, it just seems like we're adding employees, but we don't have a real plan. I would like to see, moving forward, an independent study done on animal control before we spend any dollars um, related to this millage. So I'm hoping, moving forward, that we can actually look at that. And if this add-on is voted upon, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that it's not voted upon right now and it won't be voted upon until I'm here in January. Thank you. Anybody else like to address this body? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joe Massey. I'm from Grand Blanc, Michigan. And I would like to say that I think the commissioners have done a great job up until this point. And I think the plans that the commissioners are have on the uh, table. I think they should move forward on that plan. And the reason I'm speaking here is because I have some great concerns beyond uh, what this meeting is about today. I think there are, there are more important issues that we should be focusing on than focusing on things that have been put in place that can move us forward. You have gotten the millage that you asked for. So I don't see why you should walk this uh, conversation down to any farther than moving forward with it. Thank you. Anybody else like to address this body? No. Anybody else like to address this body? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Larry Green, Mark Morris Township Supervisor. Uh, on your agenda, you have concerns with the millage in reference to animal control. I also am concerned with a study should be done in regards to how it's implemented and response times. We've had some difficulties with a couple pet bulls running loose in a portion of our township and we have spent roughly 15 days getting response from animal control 
Uh, one of them, our officers had to put down. The other one was finally caught yesterday after several uh, entrapments of the postal carrier and some of the residents in their home. And I feel a study in regards to how we're using our employees, I think would be an advisable aspect before we expand and have the plan of implementing the millage that was passed. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Uh, good morning. I'm Terry Wiseman of Swartz Creek, uh, Mr. Henry's district. I just uh, you know, heard about this ad on this morning as I got down here. And, uh, I, I can't help but think that when the motion was first put on the table, everyone in the audience, I think, believed that it was the right thing to do, to take care of the things that uh, were mentioned here this morning with HVAC and, and, and kennels and all that kind of stuff. That, my friends, is, I think, what the voters <coughs> voted for. They didn't vote to add people just haphazardly. If the, if the millage would have said, we're going to add 10 more people to an animal control shelter that most of the people that are close to it and know about it are strongly, strongly against. And it needs strong leadership. I know that sounds funny, doesn't it, John? But it's not. It needs strong leadership over there. And it needs your leadership to make sure that it comes together. That is your job, and I'm just reminding you it's your job. Trust and transparency is what the people of Genesee County expect from you, most of you, most of you. I don't think they're getting it with this, and I will tell you this. If you add 10 people just because you feel like adding 10 people because you got a big purse there sitting there with money in it, I'm not going to let you sleep real easy, okay? Have a great day. Anybody else like to address this committee? Anybody else like to address this committee? Uh, Eric Loper, Mount Morris Township. <clears throat> um, I have no doubt that the people of this community passed this millage um, with the belief that this would help improve outcomes for animals and to improve uh, circumstances. I do not think that anybody voted for this millage in the hopes that it would help to uh, alleviate general budget pressure or to reward the people with whom they had been so disappointed with up until this point. Um, they voted uh, in the millage for the coming seven years, and at the same time, they voted in a new board of commissioners. I believe that most people would have felt that the people they were voting for, the voter commissioners they had voted for, would be the people administering those funds. <clears throat> and perhaps we should uh, follow the people's wishes on that. Uh, this is a problem that uh, Archie Bailey has told us has been around for decades. Uh, so if it's decades in the making, it's not likely to be, the solutions will not likely come from a PowerPoint presentation that lacked any numbers. Uh, and was put together hastily to try to push through this funding in a lame duck session. Uh, there were five strays spotted from my house just yesterday, so what Mr. Green said is absolutely true, and none of that was addressed in that PowerPoint presentation given by Stephanie Lazar the other day. So I believe it would be irresponsible to push through on any of this without giving it more due diligence. Thank you. Anybody else like to visit the body? Good morning, Bobby Walton, Bobby uh, Davis. I had not intended to address you today, but as a member of the um, Animal Control Advisory Committee, who was here when the meeting was held, who did vote, I have to tell you that any complaints about uh, overwhelming numbers of strays, response time, will be addressed when we hire new people. I think one of the things that came out of the report that we received and that we approved was the exact description of each job and what they would do. The kinds of things that need to be done do require more people. We also need new heating, ventilating, air conditioning systems. We also need new paint. We also need uh, cage expansion. There are lots of things we need, but it enrages me for anybody to speak for me. And when somebody comes up here and tells you why the public voted for this millage, they can't speak for me. I voted for this millage because I've been following this for over two years. 
this is a problem that needs to be addressed now, and you don't need to be spending more money on some sort of a study. Thank you. Anybody else like to address this body? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Lisa Kuhn, City of Flint, formerly of Flushing. Um, as I stated in last week's meeting during public comment, I feel that there were many positions that are necessary that can be reduced to part-time. You also failed to indicate the need for an animal behaviorist. Many dogs are misclassified. I think that things need to be taken back a step and reevaluated. Thank you. Anybody else like to address this body? Anybody else like to address this body? <coughs> Good morning, my name is Richard Angelo. I live in Atlas Township. I remember right directly after the elections, because I'm here practically for every meeting, that this board gave the directive that the Animal Control Advisory Committee was to come up with a comprehensive plan on how to spend those millage funds. That's what was the exact statement given at the County Board of Commissioners meeting that day, directly after the election. The Animal Control Advisory Committee did not meet between the time of that meeting and the meeting that was held last week. That meeting was given 24, less than 24 hours notice for people to get here on the day before Thanksgiving. And the attendance that was shown by the people on the committee who didn't show up and the lack of people in the crowd that day was, was absolutely shameful. Now, if we want to come up with a comprehensive plan, and as Commissioner Bailey has said, this has been an issue for going on 20 years. How do you fix it with a PowerPoint presentation in two weeks? It can't be done. There needs to be a study done. There needs to be a comprehensive plan put together by this Animal Control Advisory Committee, just like the directive from this board came through to do. If you didn't meet in the two weeks after that meeting, there's no way that this committee, and you've heard from committee members today who have said they didn't meet, they didn't have any input into this plan, and it absolutely was not the committee's plan. It was a plan put forth by Commissioner, uh, by Director Lazar. So I, I urge you not to push this forward, give it some thought, put together a comprehensive plan on how to spend the taxpayers' money who voted for this. Anybody else like to direct this body? Anybody else like to address the body? Public comments are not closed. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Ms. Um, Pike to come forward. Do we need a Pike in the office? The question relates to a comment that was made by one of the speakers. And as I sat here, I thought, we of course want to hire the very most capable people that we can find. Um, many people may apply and may not truly be capable. With that, is there such a thing as probationary hiring? And, this, and the probation will be determined by the department head based on skill and how they approach the job situation. Is there such a thing as a probationary hiring? Mr. Uh, Sims to Commissioner Platt. Yes, um, the collective bargaining agreements and even some of the non-union positions, there are probationary <coughs> periods. Um, and during that probationary period, the department can determine whether the individual that was hired is actually suitable for the position. Um, and during that probationary period, the individual or the employee can be let go for any reason deemed necessary by the department here. So yes. Thank you for that information I needed. And I would strongly suggest that that be a consideration. Uh, we want to get the most capable people possible. That's one way to ensure it. We have to go through 10, 20, 30, 40. I don't care. But we want to get those people. And I needed that answer. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Now it's time to decide for communication. We have three presentations today, and I'm going to ask the speaker. I'm sorry, Commissioner Adams. Um, I believe we're okay to presentation. So I have, we have we have four presentations. So the four presentations, is, is each speaker could go to seven to ten minutes. Would that be a problem? 
And the first speaker, Natalie Pruitt, but we have our chairs and we have chairs. Natalie's going to try and do it in five minutes. Oh, I love it. <laughs> she could do it in three. <laughs> Um, this is a presentation, Commissioner, that you request to come to this meeting. It is, uh, yes, you did. <laughs> and it is about the blight elimination plan for the uh, mainly the city of Flint. Uh, and Natalie was the person responsible in doing the study and putting together the plan. So I am going to turn it over to before her. Before she comes up, Pardon? Know, before she comes up, can you? It was a great celebration, and I thank everybody who came. And um, we celebrated the thousands of things the Land Bank has done over the past ten years, including demolition, selling, selling property, uh, rehabbing property, um, working throughout the county in improving the uh, the light in the in getting rid of light really in this community as much as we could um, and done like I think it was a few thousand demolitions that we've done so far um, if you're asking me to repeat all no, this no, no 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 I just want to no 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 I just want you to know that I could I don't I might not have the figures right but at any rate it was a great event we thank Congressman Kildee for getting it started and for all the people who have worked to keep it going and um, we look forward to the next 10 years Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, my name is Natalie Pruitt. I'm the Program Officer of Michigan Initiatives at Center for Community Progress now. But a good majority of my work involves working with the City of Flint on blight. And so I'm here this morning to present their five-year blight elimination framework to you. Um, I think we can all agree that we are all too familiar with blight, blighted properties, vacant properties in Flint and Genesee County. So I'm going to change my presentation a little bit and I'm going to start with going through a series of maps that you may or may have not seen before. Uh, as you know, probably better than anyone else, thousands of properties annually are tax foreclosed in Genesee County, including the city of Flint. And many of these properties end up in the hands of the Genesee County Land Bank. So I'm just going to go through the land bank's accumulation of properties over the last 10 years. So here we have 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So, the point of these maps is clearly uh, the accumulation of vacant blighted properties in the county and the city of Flint is growing. Um, and you can also see that not only is the number growing, um, but where they are is expanding. In 2002, 2003, properties were mainly concentrated in the middle of the city around Buick City, uh, and they continue to expand and move towards the edges of the city as the years go on. Um, so, blight. Again, this is not new. This is something that has been talked about in this area for years and years and years. But what is new, and what I'm here to talk to you about this morning, is the way that the city of Flint is talking about blight. The way that they're talking about blight, and the way that they're going to be approaching blight moving forward. Uh, last October, of 2013, the city adopted its first comprehensive master plan in over 50 years. And one thing that came out of this master plan was that action step number one was approaching, bright, appro approaching blight uh, seriously and a little differently. And so the master plan was adopted in October, and in December, less than two months later, the city sat down and said, our first action step is to create a comprehensive, data-driven plan on how we are going to approach blight moving forward. And so I do want to emphasize that the plan that was produced is very comprehensive. It's about 120 pages. Uh, we can provide you with copies. You can download it from the city's website. We certainly don't have time in 5, 17, even 50 minutes 
to go through that entire 120 page document. So what you all should have is a very concise summary of that framework. You should all have this trifold, which summarizes the major points in the framework. Um, the goal. What is the goal? It's on the front, it's on the cover, and simply put, to stabilize Flint's population by eliminating blight in neighborhoods and improving the quality of life for residents. I think it's important to start by distinguishing this goal because one could say that they want to eliminate blight for a variety of reasons, to provoke downtown development, uh, different things. The goal of this plan is to stabilize neighborhoods and improve the quality of life for residents. So, uh, there, are two major, there are two major components to the framework. The first was really understanding the problem. Again, a lot of great work has been done to demolish, proper, to demolish blighted properties over the years, um, but there was no one single central look at how many properties are there, how many blighted properties are there, what needs to be done to them, what's it going to cost. Uh, so the first thing that we did as part of this project was we did a lot of number crunching and data gathering. So I'm going to go through uh, the numbers that you have before you today. And to start <coughs> things off, there are about 20,000 properties that will need some kind of blight elimination over the next five years. That includes about 14,000 vacant lots. Uh, admittedly, not all vacant lots are blighted. You know, some are side lots that people have purchased, some are gardens, uh, but this changes. Vacant lot maintenance changes. Some vacant lots are blighted today, they're not tomorrow, and vice versa. So 20,000 properties need some kind of blight elimination. That includes 14,000 vacant lots, and that also includes about 6,000 structures that will need to be demolished over the next five years. How much will this cost? I mean, that's, I guess, to jump ahead, we're saying 20,000 properties need some kind of blight elimination. How much will this cost? Well, after you do the math on demolition, mowing, removing trash, even boarding, uh, the total comes to about $112 million over the next five years. And of that, uh, we know that there are currently funding commitments of about $10 million. Uh, so there is a gap, admittedly. Uh, there is a need to do some serious fundraising, uh, to do some serious organizing. So that's an overview of blight, how many properties, what it will cost. If you look in the center panel of your brochure, I think one thing that many of us learned, maybe many of us already knew it, uh, is the number of these vacant properties that are privately owned, the number of these properties that are vacant and blighted and are impacting neighborhood conditions, impacting city corridor conditions. 68% uh, of that cost, to jump to it, 68% of that $112 million comes from privately owned vacant properties. Uh, absentee landlords, things of that nature. Um, and so what I think is important to emphasize here today is when the city looked at that number and saw that 68% of this cost comes from privately owned properties. Uh, the first thing that it did was step forward and say, now that we have this plan done, our action step number one is to work on this. The city knows that it needs to take a step back and look at its code enforcement uh, and figure out a system that works here. You know, code enforcement is not typically set up uh, to deal with properties where the owner has very little interest. The idea of code enforcement is that you have a property owner that actually has an interest in their property. And so it's not easy, uh, but that is the city's commitment uh, in this first year that they are going to take a long and serious look at how it can work to address this 68% of properties that are privately owned. Uh, so those are the numbers. And the rest of the framework really focuses on how the city and others 
can work on dealing with blight uh, more strategically and more collaboratively moving forward. So again, look at the look at the 120 page document. You'll see that there are clear, detailed roles defined uh, in many different places. But again, if you look at the center panel, uh, to sum it up, there are five key partners that are identified. Uh, starting with local government, the role for local government is to raise money. Raise money to do these things. Raise money for blight elimination. Businesses and developers. Businesses and developers are part of our community, so there's a role for them. Institutions, foundations, uh, large stakeholders here in Flint and Genesee County. There's a role identified for them. Community groups. Uh, for those of you that were downtown last night at the Land Banks dinner, uh, community groups do a lot. Um, and so really, this acknowledges the work that they're doing throughout our community and asks them to keep it up. And finally, residents. Uh, one statistic that's not in this brochure but that I think is telling is if every resident who lived next to a vacant lot would just mow that one lot, that's it. They just mowed their lot and one next to it. Uh, it would save about $14 million over five years. $14 million that someone, whether it's the city, whether it's the land bank, whether it's someone else, doesn't have to contract and pay someone to drive heavy equipment over to that site, mow it, and continue to do that. Um, there are action steps beyond the one that I mentioned about code enforcement. Those are listed. One thing that we've talked about is using uh, technology more. So having something like an online portal where residents and community members can look up information about properties. Who owns that property next door? Who's not mowing it? So that they can easily get that kind of information. Um, and so in closing, I think that I just want to reiterate that certainly the challenges of blight are not new uh, to our city and to our county, but the city's approach and how it's looking at this problem and how it plans on addressing it moving forward, um, I think is very uh, is something to pay attention to. Commissioner <coughs> Curry? Thank you, Nancy. You did an excellent job here today and last night. Have you worked on or talked to, to the legislators about a dedicated revenue stream, such as an impact fee similar to a, a, register, a, deed, a recorded deed, to where you can accumulate a dedicated revenue stream over a period of time, then leverage that out for bonding say like a $20 million bond, uh, a line of credit, <coughs> continue to tear down blight of homes, increase public safety by eliminating blight, increase values in the rest of the communities as they come back. Have you, have you looked and we'll start working on anything like that? So I can say I have not looked at that, but I think that is a great idea. That is a great idea and I'm sure we would love to think more about that and work on it. Yes. Thank you. And we have the county treasurers have introduced a number of ideas, uh, along with um, uh, Congress McKinley in helping get the you know state legislature to deal with that. It's been difficult because of the um, the, w the makeup of the legislature and the unwillingness right now to <coughs> increase fees or. But it is a win win because oh, it as is. you take down the blanks, the values come back and right. the green space come back, and then the property can be reused and repurposed. It's a win win, and it also contributes enormously to the public safety in the communities. And the community can almost right size itself within itself by I agree. doing that. Yeah, I agree. And we will continue to advocate for that at the Michigan legislature. It's, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Natalie, an excellent presentation, and Land Bank is doing a wonderful job. You made a statement about uh, encouraging homeowners, privately uh, owned homeowners, to uh, abide by the code. What, in your discussion, have you come up with maybe ways to uh, encourage or persuade or even force a homeowner 
to abide by the code. Yeah. So one thing I want to emphasize is, you know, I, I use the term code enforcement, and we use it in here. I don't know that, frankly, it's the best term to use in what we're talking about. Um, what we're talking about is really addressing vacant properties. When we look at these numbers, you know, occupied properties, whether they're uh, owner-occupied or rentals, um, they're not at the heart of the problem. And so really what we're talking about is somehow approaching vacant properties so that if you, if you own a vacant property and you want to continue to own it and you're going to maintain it, that we work to increase that level of maintenance and upkeep, but that you can't just simply sit on a property in perpetuity that's next to one where someone else lives. You cannot simply do that as it continues to deteriorate, as it's half burned down, uh, as windows are broken. Um, this is very, very, very early in the conversation. It's something that we have said as a goal that we're working on over the next year. So you are discussing it. Yes. And any, any uh, suggestions or ideas that the commission has from your perspective as community leaders are more than welcome. Thank you. I will also just add that we have Megan Hunter here, who is the Director of Planning and Development for the city, is the one who really started this project. So if you have any questions that for Megan also. And, and I did want to add that we actually, in our CDBG allocation this year, we allocated $250,000 for code enforcement because of the, the data. Um, and not only to address vacant structures, but we also are cognizant that there's a lot of issues with um, rental properties and, and also sometimes homeowners, <coughs> regrettably. Um, we have Raul Garcia, who's our blight manager, who's been out there um, doing great work, seeing, um, addressing about 300 complaints a month. So um, we're, we are trying to address that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else regarding this issue? Thank you. This time, we'd like to ballot check to come before us. Followed by Mr. Ballot check, we'll have Maxine Daniels and then Stephanie Lagarde. Any other communication? Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Clack had requested that I come before the board and do a presentation on Ebola preparedness from the county's perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Um, Mr. Kravithik, though, had a personal family issue this morning, so um, uh, we, we talk on a regular basis, though I serve on the Medical Control Authority Board, so um, I can, I think, cover some of the issues with regards to EMS. Um, the Ebola outbreak that we currently have primarily involves three countries, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and uh, Guinea in West Africa. Um, so it's really a, a worldwide problem uh, being led by the World Health Organization. Um, here in the United States, the lead agency is the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. But you can see the bulk of the cases are in those three countries. Um, there have been some in bordering countries and countries that, uh, like Spain and the United States, that have had um, medical personnel that have um, been infected. Um, public health preparedness has um, been at the forefront really since 9-11 and the um, anthrax scare that uh, happened after that time. Uh, the federal government produced um, plans that they uh, wanted to see implemented <coughs> at the state and the local level. So we have a set of accreditation standards that we're required to meet as a local health department. We're evaluated by the state uh, for all of our programs on a three-year cycle, um, but for emergency preparedness, we have an annual evaluation that occurs. Um, and it has to cover a whole host of different issues related to community preparedness, 
um, how we would deal with a situation like you may recall back in 2009 when we had the H1N1 virus, we had to uh, quickly roll out the vaccine when it became available and administer it uh, in collaboration with our medical care partners. Um, that's just one example. We have um, occasional instances where we have white powder incidents, um, where someone receives in the mail uh, a white powder and we have to respond appropriately to assure that it's uh, not something of, of danger. Um, we're into flu season. Uh, we uh, had our first cases, you know, we're really trying to promote vaccination for flu. Um, it, it's an ongoing issue for us. We, uh, earlier this year, had enterovirus E68, um, which was, uh, although it's not a new virus, um, it was sort of rearing its ugly head and having um, a more dangerous effect this year. So uh, again, uh, we work on a regular basis, uh, developing plans, the health department sponsors what's known as the Genesee County <coughs> Health Prep Preparedness Committee. It's made up of the three hospital systems, EMS, the Medical Control Authority, the uh, Genesee Intermediate School District, our area of colleges and universities, police, fire, the county sheriff's uh, emergency management section, the Department of Human Services, Genesee Health System, the Bishop Airport Authority, MTA 911, the Red Cross, and a whole host of other healthcare providers. And we meet on a quarterly basis uh, as a committee of the whole. Uh, we also have periodic meetings with individual groups to deal with uh, emergency preparedness issues. So we've had, during the enterovirus D68, as an example, we met with the school superintendents to develop <coughs> fact sheets and policies and improve the information flow with regards to that situation. Uh, we also conduct and participate in exercises on a regular basis. So um, we've had exercises with all three of the hospitals with regards to the potential for an Ebola case being seen in the emergency room at one of our medical centers, and our staff has participated in those exercises. In terms of uh, the current status, um, back in late October, the CDC established guidelines for monitoring people who may have been exposed to Ebola virus. And basically, they're calling for um, a, a daily contact with, uh, from the local health authority uh, for at least the 21-day period that they potentially could come down with the disease. Uh, Michigan decided to implement uh, twice a day contact policy, and so far the state has uh, currently 11 individuals that are being monitored by local health departments, and there are 21 individuals that have been monitored are through the 21-day period, um, and uh, we have no current cases of Ebola. Um, the active monitoring, though, occurs primarily because these individuals travel through the countries where the Ebola outbreak is currently occurring. Um, the um, department has worked collaboratively with uh, the hospitals. Um, what we're looking for in terms of early signs and symptoms, uh, if you look at this, for the 21-day period, fever, headaches, diarrhea, vomiting, stomach pain, unexplained bleeding, bruising, muscle pain. Uh, these are similar to a lot of other conditions, but again, uh, the key here is have they had a potential uh, travel exposure or been exposed to an individual um, through a healthcare treatment of an Ebola case. Um, Ebola only spreads when people are sick. Okay, one of the things that happened early on, you may recall uh, in the, uh, the case in Texas where the nurse traveled uh, on an airliner, um, she was not sick. Um, so individuals were not exposed to the disease, um, but it did require uh, sort of a better handle on 
uh, assuring that people are properly followed if they've had an exposure, um, and self-quarantine um, to alleviate sort of the panic that occurred in, in that situation. Uh, again, it's, it's a 21-day period that the individual needs to be followed um, to assure that they don't come out with any signs or symptoms. Uh, of so uh, we're, we're following primarily CDC protocols um, that are passed on to us through the State Department of Community Health. Uh, so we're working collaboratively with uh, those entities. We have um, weekly calls with the CDC and weekly calls with the State Department of Community Health. Uh, we've had special meetings with uh, airport authority. We've had special meetings with EMS, special meetings with police and fire, special meetings with the three hospital systems to deal with and sort of roll out the CDC protocols and make sure people are aware of what the, the current best practices are in terms of what's recommended. Um, the likelihood of contracting Ebola in the United States is extremely low unless a person has direct unprotected contact with blood or body fluids. Um, the risk of Ebola is elevated in um, certain communities uh, where the outbreak is occurring. Again, the three countries are Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. Um, the signs and symptoms, as I mentioned, are, are very similar to other diseases. In fact, if you have these signs and symptoms in these African countries, it, it, it's more likely that you have malaria than Ebola. So that's been a challenge for them also. Um, the CDC um, decided that they wanted to establish a tier system for hospitals to determine what was their level of preparedness and ability to handle a case. We kind of, by trial and error, um, the hospital in Texas, I, I think, was not um, completely prepared for the situation. and. Um, the individual was turned away on his first visit, and I think that that uh, case taught us a lesson on the need to better prepare our hospital staff by <coughs> asking the right questions and making sure that they've got the right kinds of personal protective equipment in place should they have a case turn up in their facility. So what the CDC did was they established a four-tier system for hospitals. Um, this is what the Michigan Department of Community Health sent out to hospitals across the state, and states could self-identify what tier level they were prepared to um, function at. Um, the hospitals in our community are at tier three, so they have an ability to hold for 24 to 48 hours an individual, and then they would be transferred to a treatment facility. Um, there are 35 hospitals across the country that have identified as Tier 1 and are willing to be treatment facilities. Um, and this is an example of sort of the protocol that uh, EMS, 911, and hospitals would follow if we had uh, a, a case identified or a person suspect of uh, having an exposure to Ebola. Uh, and again, we've communicated all these guidelines to um, the appropriate entities. Um, the Ebola virus outbreak uh, has been changing on a continual basis because of international travel. A disease like this is just a, a plane right away. So we have to be ever vigilant and understand that um, the situation can quickly change. Um, but the facts about Ebola, you can't get Ebola through the air, you can't get Ebola through the water, you can't get Ebola through food that's grown or legally purchased in the United States. Uh, the transmission occurs through humans. Uh, the virus can be spread uh, through con contact with specific body fluids that are infected also through uh, needles and syringes that are contaminated. Uh, we also know that this is a disease that is not only in humans, it's also found in other primates. 
and it's suspected that the reservoir for the disease may actually be fruit bats. So that makes it a little more difficult for us to try and control. If this was a disease like smallpox that only existed in humans, then we have the ability to develop a vaccine and, and potentially eradicate the disease. But when you have an animal reservoir, it makes it much more difficult. So uh, again, there's concentrated work going on now and resources that are being in, um, employed in, in uh, West African countries where the primary uh, outbreak is occurring, um, including uh, individuals from the CDC and other um, governments uh, across the, the globe. Um, when an individual is traveling from one of these countries and enters the United States, there are five airports in the country that have direct flights from these countries. Um, all of them, along with the other airports, um, have received um, instructions but individuals traveling from these countries uh, are given basically a, a, a packet of, of educational information. They're given a digital thermometer. Um, they're also being given a mobile phone and contact information to the local health department in the jurisdiction where there is their end route. So that local health department then is contacted and they're required to follow the CDC protocol and follow them for 21 days to make sure there are not signs and symptoms. So they're checking their temperature, um, assuring that there are no other signs and symptoms that are, are common for Ebola. If there are, then um, medical measures are taken. Um, so again, we have a, a standard protocol that we follow. Uh, if we were to have an individual um, the, the challenges in, in trying to prevent uh, spread, uh, we learned sort of again by trial and error that you've got to be very careful with personal protective equipment. You have to double glove. You have to make sure that both in putting on and taking off the gear that um, you're not contaminating yourself. Uh, you've got to make sure that you're completely covered early in the outbreak. The, the Dallas nurses were not completely covered with their um, <coughs> protective equipment. So um, we sp suspect that that was the reason why a couple of them um, did get exposure. Um, the other challenge in Africa is uh, doing education to assure that uh, they're following safe burial practices and that they're not eating bush meat that may be contaminated with the Ebola virus because the suspicion is that the crossover to humans occur from eating the bush meat. So. Any more questions, Commissioner Henry? Can you go back to the first slide? Yes. I that heard was... a number this morning on the Michigan Public Radio was way higher than that. So was it growing that back? Well, this is the number for this this outbreak. Um, again, this is a disease that has uh, occurred in other um, cases in other African countries previously. So it could have included. Uh, historical cases before this outbreak. Because Ebola's been with us for decades. Yes, we may the Commissioner Clack. What would Bruce have added to any of this were he there? Well, one of the challenges uh, we had early on was uh, what if 911 gets a call, um, who of our uh, EMS are prepared to handle the case of a potential Ebola patient. Um, early on, again, because this happened so rapidly, 
suddenly you had every EMS agency, every hospital in the country ordering this same personal protective equipment, and so it's back ordered. So um, we had to first find out who was willing to handle the case, and we had five of our EMS entities that were willing to uh, handle Ebola cases, but none of them had the recommended um, personal protective gear at the time. So we had to assure that they ordered that. Uh, we know that one of them does have it currently in stock, so they're prepared to handle the case, and the others have it on back order. Who is that? Um, you're, you're, you're testing me, aren't you? Um, I, I have their name in my office, but I don't have them. I'm just curious. I'd want to call them. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. Well, 911 has that information, so all you need to know is call 911. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Bailey, because uh, that's what that was one of the issues when I brought this up, because I wanted to know who in our county would be the first responders and were they capable. Let me thank you, Mark. I know you've done a lot of work on this, and we truly needed to be educated with this information. I am concerned about whether or not our paramedics were trained or are trained because they, to me, would be the first responders. Am I correct? Well, I mean, if a person were ill and went to the hospital, then what? Well, typically what's happening is that they are, that, you know, as in the case of the uh, gentleman from Liberia, he went directly to the hospital. Mm -hmm. and, and actually the recommendation is if you can drive, to go ahead and drive so that we're not taking the unit out of service because um, the signs and symptoms, you know, we're following these patients. If we see an elevated fever, we want them to, to travel to the hospital, and usually they're still in a condition where they can travel. Um, but once we've got a suspect case, the state laboratory here in Michigan is certified to do testing for Ebola, so we would collect a sample, send it to the state. It would also get confirmed at the CDC lab, uh, the CDC then has a rapid response team that they would send immediately to that hospital. And then, as I mentioned, our hospitals are tier three, so they would ha only handle the, the patient for 24, 48 hours, and then they would be shipped to another uh, tier one hospital. If you recall, Mark, we had a discussion at the health department board meeting about the slow response from the CDC. Have they changed, that? my question, number one, has the CDC changed their policy? Have they increased their response? Because that was a big problem. And also, if white powder, which was very prevalent about a year or so ago, appeared in our county in any way, who then would be the responder to that? Well, uh, we had an incident just uh, about a month ago. Did you really? Yes. Um, an individual appeared at one of our uh, medical centers with a white powder. And so um, we have a protocol that we follow. Um, we contact the state police. The state police does an investigation. Uh, again, testing can be done at the State Department of Community Health Laboratory. Um, this turned out to be just packing material. Um, but, you know, we want to err on the side of safety. Of course. And the CDC have they increased their, or changed their rules at all? Yeah, they, they recognize that um, they really need to have a specialized sort of SWAT team that comes to any hospital. You know, uh, Texas, this is a community hospital, and they, they weren't as prepared as they needed to be. And, and we understood that you know the guidelines changed in terms of recommendations for personal protective equipment uh, a lot of hospitals didn't have and some still don't have what's recommended and what they do have would not last for a, a treatment period for an individual which is why they developed the tier system so that we can concentrate our resources appropriately and make sure that staff that are handling these patients Patients can be protected. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anybody else like to?
as you can see, the Sheriff's Department is building their website on Revised now too, rather than paying a separate entity. Um, some have chose to go their own, the circuit court did. So we just try to tie it all with the same look and feel. And I think I'm under five minutes. I can say in the 12 years that I've been here, we've been from the Stone Age to this, which is, I mean, uh, you, you have to be congratulated for this because it, it's one of the best that I've seen. It's very robust. It doesn't break down. It's up when we're not. Um, if we lose power, people can still get to this website. It's fantastic. Anybody else? Next presentation for our animal control director. All right. Good morning, commissioners. I thank you for the opportunity to let us cover our future plans for animal control at this time. As you can see, our problems. Um, staffing is a critical problem for the shelter since all the budget cuts since 2009. We have inadequate, inadequate staffing for routine calls, inadequate for enforcement. That's animal cruelty, neglect, dangerous dogs, and that's also assist law enforcement. Um, on our very best days, we have two vehicles on the road. Majority of the days, one vehicle for the road. That could be 40 calls. We could start out our first call for the day being 10 in the hole for animal bites. That is quarantining. That means we have to go find the animal, do a report, observe the animal, either take the animal for a quarantine at the shelter, or go over the options with the owner for the safety of the person who was bitten. Um, then next in line for calls, we have to assist, we try to assist police and law enforcement. And unfortunately, with one vehicle on the road, as Mr. Green stated, sometimes there's a long wait for assistance. We might be on the other side of the county. Sometimes we have multiple agencies calling us at the same time for assistance. Next, that puts animals that are injured and still alive, animals that have um, been abused or animals hit by cars that need assistance. Next, we check on conditions of animals. These are animals that may not have shelter, may not have food, may have been left behind. Um, and at this time, too, we only have first shift officers. At one point, we had second shift. We no longer have second shift. We no longer have advanced hours for service on the weekends or after hours. So at this point, if an animal is injured or needs assistance, they have to rely on law enforcement to assist them or a good citizen. And as we all know, law enforcement already is short-staffed with themselves. This is also causing problems with staffing within. This is causing staff to work sick. Um, this is making it un not possible for ongoing staff training. We have no one to cover them to go to clinics or seminars to learn about advancement. We have burnout for staff. I mean, think about what it's like for an officer who's been there for 15 years, was always able to get to their calls, had a good reputation. Now they're getting ripped up by the public, by people going out on the calls, and by law enforcement for the fact that everybody has to wait for that person to get there. Unfortunately, that person cannot keep up to all the calls. Facility problems. Our building is adequate as the state has said, but it is aging. We need ongoing maintenance and we need um, to update our building. We get in a lot of animals that are large. It's cramming them into the cages that are size of crates. In animals that are court cases that we may sit on for six months, it's not fair to them to be housed in such a small space. This is a chart of right now of what we have for staffing. You see, we have myself, we do have a part-time secretary posted, and we're going to start interviewing, I believe, this week. We have a dispatcher. On paper, we have four um, animal control officers. We're in the process of trying to fill one that's off on medical leave and we have two kennel attendants. And that's a problem because that's two people to care for all the animals in the building and two people to tend to all the people that come into the building for service. That includes dog licenses or any other sort of assistance someone may need at the counter. Our role for priority staff improvements is an animal control specialist. We had one of these in the past. That person is in charge of any cases that may be cruelty, dog fighting, anything like that. At this time, our numbers and cases are down because we don't have the manpower to be able to go out and investigate and check these conditions. You have to be able to investigate with neighbors, 
work with the prosecutor, be able to take this to court. And at this time, we just don't have the staffing to go after certain cases like we have in the past. Um, a volunteer events coordinator. Any large shelter that has a lot of staff had one of these. You need someone to be able to work with the volunteers, maintain the volunteers you have, bring in new volunteers, offer adequate training, help develop events for fundraising and for adoptions. And this person would also help us to investigate for grants so we can continue getting this money in and use that towards medical, spaying, neutering, things like that. We definitely need a secretary full-time. There is a lot of administrative paperwork involved in operating a shelter dealing with records pertaining to that many animals, cases, and dog licenses. Asking for five more animal control officers. That puts us back into having officers broken into areas in the community. In the past, they were broken into sections so that we had people available for cities and townships without them having to wait two hours for someone to clear their last call and get around town, get across town. Two more additional kennel attendants. That means we always have people to take care of the animals and to make sure people are being assisted at the counter. And let me say those five more animal control officers addition means we'll also have second shift again and we'll have more expanded hours on the weekends for animals in need. The two more kennel attendants will mean it's possible for us to be open on Saturdays again. That is the reason we closed on Saturdays is due to inadequate staffing. And here is a general job description that's going to be posted if approved for the volunteer events coordinator. And that's in your packet. The animal control specialist. And that would be a um, staffing chart. And what this will do is provide effective staffing, allow appropriate training for the staff and teamwork. We can go back to being able to get to our calls. Unfortunately, at this time, I meet calls every day of people not understanding why we can't come get that stray dog that's been roaming their street for two weeks. Unfortunately, that call is prioritized and it gets to the bottom of the list. Um, physical improvements. We all know our building needs some work done. Um, vehicle cage fittings, um, at this time we're looking into possible different vehicles for winter. In the winter those vans are horrible because they're heavy on one side. We can't get outside roads that haven't been tended to in the winter. Um, looking into our ventilation system, that's been an ongoing complaint for years. The dog runs, we like to redo a section and make that into dog runs instead of the stack cages, especially for the large dogs in court case animals, they have to be held a long time. At this time we only have five dog runs and they're not the best of quality. We need proper lighting for the um, interior of the building, general, even though you come in there, it's dark during the day, when you know we have lots of windows. Um, emergency lighting. At this time, due to break-ins and such, we have to leave the lights on in the building because you can't see the film footage if the lights are turned off. Lighting outside the building, I will tell you, when you leave the building late at night, it's pretty scary out there in the woods. Um, so for safety for everybody involved. Um, we also need painting interior. Not only are we starting to flake in certain areas, it will help make a big difference to the environment for people also. Um, more security cameras, interior and exterior, that is a safety for, for people. And again, we do have people who try to break in when we have a case animals in our building and improve our walkways. Here is a picture of, I'm sure a lot of people recognize this, it's Humane Society of Genesee County. These are a picture of their dog runs, and this is something that we're um, looking at. From problem to problem, we move from inadequate service to the public to quality service. Move from adequate facility to a good facility and continue on these improvements. Although problems will take time to resolve, with support and cooperation, we can move forward to a future of excellence. And those things on our, our list for building improvements, those are things we're looking at, and I'm sure other things will pop up, but those are things like everybody's concerned, the amount of money those cost. That's why we need to have, I'll go and investigate other facilities, make sure what kind of style we want to go with, and get the cost. Because we need to look at a lot of these options. We're going to have to do some major changes to our drainage system also. So this is something that I don't think again, we should rush into for like the run changes and things like that. We need to make sure we're going on the right path because that's a costly and a permanent change to the building. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, 
Yes, we did. And you reduced that down to one shift. Then. Correct. Due to the budget cuts, we lost almost half of our staff. We, so. haven't, we haven't had any budget cuts in your department since I've been here in the last two years. Well, in 2009 when I'm I came. I'm not talking about 2009. I'm talking about now. When you came, came back this last year. There was time. no second shift at this time. Correct. Okay. And all four officers only worked in two vans when you started? No, they were in multiple vans, but due to safety issues, we had to double them up. It is very difficult when you go into certain areas. Um, police are hard to get a hold of because they also have their own priorities. When we have to go to people's homes and there's multiple dogs or multiple dogs behind houses, one person cannot get multiple aggressive dogs running loose behind an abandoned house. Someone has to be able to be there to be able to at least hit the emergency button. One of those things that I look at, like I say, I know police that work in single car uh, that, that, that have previously, you know, were two officers working at a time that have been cut back because of budget cuts and that type of thing. And and so, you know, I just just question the, the, the total rationale because I would say if it's an emergency situation like that, I would say, okay, send two vans right. versus one, and that way. When it's not those emergency situations, then, then we wouldn't be in a situation where we're wasting additional manpower uh, that could maybe be better, better utilized in other, other positions. I understand what you're saying, sir, but a lot of these calls are in areas where there are multiple dogs, they're dangerous areas, and they have nothing but one trank shot for an animal and a catch pole. And I've had them with multiple two men together be cornered or surrounded. So it is a safety issue. You, you can't watch your back when people are surrounding you or have multiple dogs in a pack when there is only one of you. And you don't always know what you're walking upon until you get there. Well, and that's the reason why I say you could still have multiple vans and have two vans, vans arrive. We can debate this back right. and forth. Right. And in areas where crime I'm is less. To, uh, I, I'm not going to concede to your, your way of managing that, that staff in that manner. Uh, how long did this presentation take you to to develop this PowerPoint presentation? This is your presentation that you presented to the Animal Control Advisory Committee? or This is the one we presented to the meeting the other day, yes. I didn't say we, I said you. I did have help with it. I'm trying to show show a point. And, 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 and my patience has been really Sounds good to right really now. To me. And because of the area that I represent, even as of Monday, when I was out visiting an elderly person, and Mr. Green and I already spoke about the dogs in that area, I don't know where you live at, but this woman was afraid to come out of her house. And she had called Mr. Green several times. So let's be careful about, you know, that. Anything else, Commissioner? Are you I'm finished? Not finished? No. Okay. I just wanted to, to say, you know, if with, with this, I don't see. I see a lot of vague information here. I don't see specifics, well, which is is what I wanted to see and what I what I've asked for before. And I just don't see the specific information. So with that, I'll be finished. Commissioner Adams and then Commissioner. You have pros and cons on each side, so let's be respectful. I may not agree with it, but we're going to be somewhat respectful. We're, gonna, we're not going to micromanage. I mean, this may be my last week, but we're not going to micromanage. We're going to allow the director to do her job just like we allow the sheriff, the controller, the treasurer, and other 
probably didn't do his or her job. I very much agree with that, um, and I very much agree that we need to let directors do their job, and we need to give all directors the tools to do that. At an earlier in public comment, a number of people who have actually worked against the village um, have voiced their views on how it should be used. Here's the thing. It's not a mystery about the problems. We know that there are a lot more
something that the new board is going to have to deal with. We've got one more meeting. We've got the end of the year coming up. And um, we've got some experts coming in on the new board that I think can resolve this. And I would be willing to pass it on to them. It's not costing us anything in the meantime uh, other than to do the best we can. for the standard county physical and testing. Is it more about the training and the personal protective equipment? Have we accounted for the cost associated with doing any of that? If they don't come already certified, most of the training there is no charge. You have them work under the prosecutor's office, the sheriff's department, other departments that... Okay, that I understand that, but my point is OSHA regulations, forget about the prosecutor, forget about the sheriff. Right. Are we adequately going to be past all of our inspections and they do go through the Department of Ag to learn I'm about I'm talking about the inspections. I'm talking about the OSHA regulations as it pertains to handling of animals. Are we adequately protecting these new employees? Have we done a job hazard analysis? Do we know what we're getting into? I, I guess I can get you one of those, but... But it hasn't been done yet. We know we're going to hire... This is like, to me, this is what it sounds like. We're going to hire a bunch of firefighters to fight a fire. We're not going to provide them with training, and we're not going to provide them with personal protective equipment to keep them from doing the job right. We give them all the personal protection I'm allowed to give them. I've tried to get them more. This is why they're stuck with what they have, is that's all I'm allowed to give them. So, so do employees wear respirators? No. Should they? Well, I guess that is stuff to look into. But We should look into that before we hire them. For now, for now, I'll reserve my, my right to talk later on again. Sheriff's Department goes through extensive training and so does the EMS Department. We're dealing with, with animals, some of which have diseases that are transmittable to humans. We're dealing with animals that, that can't be vicious. Are we adequately going to have these employees trained before they start? Do we have a plan in place to train these employees and adequately protect them from the hazards that exist on this job? 
that is basic training for certification. So yes, the state has to, the state says that yes, they've met these requirements for training. So. Yeah, we're talking about the Department of Ag, are we talking about OSHA regulations? Michigan OSHA. I've never had any dealings with OSHA other than coming in and checking the building safety and things like that. I've never had them involved in the exact handling of the animals or things on the street. This is why an outside auto about probationary hiring. Mm -hmm. That's something that I hope you consider. Uh, it may alleviate some future problems. Yes. We want the most capable people that we can hire. I agree. And the probation may take care of that. If you know their initial qualifications don't appear to be as they should be, please consider the probation. Commissioner Bailey, what is the alternative if we don't approve this today? Uh, you go on looking at you, You're asking my personal thing, you're asking the five. Special Services. 
contract. Go ahead. Parts. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. All right, OG, controller's office. Request approval January 2015 overtime request. All right. Go ahead. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Um, the next item is from the HR Delta Dental Renewal. Go ahead. Support. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. And the final one is from Animal Control. Go ahead. Support. Support. Commissioner Renewal. Uh, I would uh, recommend that this get sent back to uh, finance to review at this point in time because I haven't seen any uh, actual total cost associated with this. I do see the, the broad based numbers as far as what the individual positions uh, are, but that this at this point in time is kind of like uh, giving a kid a credit card and not knowing the limit and letting him go spend whatever he wants. Uh, I would ask if the controllers uh, has specific numbers on all these positions to tell us what the total cost of this request would be through the chair. So, Commissioner, I knew you were going to say that. I, I knew you were going to ask that question, but guess what? We have bylaws here, right? I need an attorney to read the bylaws. I just want you to hear because, see, contrary to people's popular belief, I want us to adhere to the bylaws in this because it has been really divisive. So read the bylaws in this particular, and this is why we're moving this forward. Just be a little more specific. The bylaws in regard the the finance and the organization. You, you mean the specific responsibilities yes. of the government? Yes, as opposed to sending back to the finance subcommittee, which I had an issue with in the beginning. Wait, wait, wait. Now, who wrote these bylaws? I didn't write them. Did I? This board has board. adopted them over time. Uh, so over time, this board has followed these bylaws, right? Okay, so read the bylaws. And if you don't have a copy, you know, I would suggest you get an incoming commission. Get a copy of the bylaws so you know what you're talking about. Commissioners, I believe this section that Commissioner Sims is referring to is under the responsibilities of the Governmental Operations Committee as a whole. Yes. And it talks about one of the, it shall be the responsibility of this committee to, and uh, item. Please do, because I want to make sure I will read that part and then read the other. So item B says consider matters affecting the operation. The, op what, the operation? Um, and it lists uh, the county clerk, circuit district and probate courts, friend of the court, adult probation, citizens probation authority, emergency management department, the animal control department, and the board of canvassers. Okay. Now let's go down to the finance department staff. the adequacy of county personnel and to make recommendations as to retention, increase, decreases, or changes in classifications of department personnel. Did y'all hear that? So therefore, we don't have to go to the finance subcommittee. And this department, if my memory serves me correct, Commissioner Bailey, you probably know this, they lost that. It was a decree two years ago, maybe no, four years ago. Because of budget cuts, they lost that. So we're not creating any new position. We're just adding on what we're taking in. And that's according to our bylaws. And what else? There's another piece that I want you to read. Who's your staff? So the face of the point that you're making is new. So we've already had the discussion. Now we have a roll call if you want to vote on this. But the roll call is to put it on the agenda. And now we're going to vote on this item. So, any more discussion? Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I still ask for the show. I'm not going to acknowledge it because it's a mute point. And, and, oh, no, no. And it's a mute point because I don't agree with the tactics that have been used this morning, and that's not consistent with our bylaws, so we're going to give it a point. Well, and those bylaws we routinely uh, change, just like we changed from just the clerk away from from the, your no, committee. No, no, we didn't change the. Commissioner, uh, I'm not going to have this discussion with you. You know, this is not the appropriate place. You and I, we can deal with it behind closed doors, but we're not going to deal with it out here. Because I don't appreciate what has occurred today and throughout this process. 
the people have voted. We're going to carry this out. We're going to follow the wishes of the people. Now, you say, well, we can pass the buck. No, that's the problem with this county. For so long, we passed the buck, and then we had to make the tough decision. And here we are. Let's deal with it and move on. You know, enough of this discussion act on it. So, question recall. other business? If not, Commissioner Clark, any commission is really called? Not today. Commissioner Curtis? No, thank you. Northrop? No. Young? No. Brown? Thank you, but no. Bailey? Henry? No, thank you. Adam? Meeting to
get plans for the building. As of right now, our main problem is the staffing. Um, we have inadequate staffing for routine calls, inadequate for enforcement. At this time, some mornings we start out with 40 calls in the hole. On the best day, we have two vehicles on the road, most days one. We have to start with the priority calls, and first of all, that is assisting law enforcement. Sometimes we have more than one agency waiting for assistance. They called us this morning before staff even started with needing assistance with a raid. Then comes after that is animals that need to be caught or quarantined that have bitten people. That's for the safety of the public. After that, we follow with animals that are injured and still alive. Then we follow with check conditions on animals. And as you all know, we have a problem with stray animals running the streets. And unfortunately, that gets put at the bottom of the call list. With adequate staffing, that will be attended to. Um, this is also causing overworking of the staff. People do come in working sick. It's taking an emotional drain on them. And it does affect how we do perform our jobs. Our facility at this time is adequate, as the state has said. But it is aging. And we do need to do ongoing maintenance and need to modern, modernize our building. Not only for practicality, for tending to the animals, but again for the animals' comfort. This is a flow chart of the employees we have at this time. As you can see, there's myself. We have a secretary part-time position posted. We have a dispatcher. We have um, four officers actually um, on the road at this time. And we have two kennel attendants. And those two kennel attendants, in addition to tending to all the animals, also have to work the counter. And so some days if the counter service is real busy, people getting licensed, adoptions, return to owner, sometimes that line is almost to the door. And then we have to make that decision of are we going to tend to the animals right now or tend to the people in line. For our staff improvements, we like an animal control specialist. In the past, we had one of those. And that person's main focus is not only to assist on the road, but that person is to assist for cases. Sometimes when you have, are investigating a situation, it takes a lot of time involved to go out there multiple times. You have to gather information from maybe times we visited before, police reports, investigating with the neighbors. And then after you gather that information, then you have legal paperwork to do. You have to work with the prosecutor and the police departments. This is an ongoing thing. And then you have to prepare this for court. And at this time, we're not doing as many cases as we used to for the fact that we don't have the manpower to investigate all these cases. And this not only includes animal neglect, but this includes animal fighting and those sort of things. And that's what the animal control specialist main focus is. We'd like to have a volunteer and events coordinator. And I think that's really important. Most shelters, as they progress, have one of these. Right now, we have lots of volunteers willing to help. But unfortunately, we don't have the manpower and staff to work with them effectively to continue growing. If we have a volunteer coordinator, that person can help train them, direct them into the areas we need to grow. This includes doing events not only for fundraising for the animals for the future, but for adoption events. This person, too, would also help us in, um, do research for grants, because as everybody said, there are a lot of grants out there. But unfortunately, at this time, we don't have the manpower to investigate or proceed with those. Um, we definitely need a secretary. And to a lot of people, that may not seem important, but administrative staff is important. We have no one at this time. That means it includes myself, some of my officers, and my kennel attendants. A secretary position is a full-time job there. We have to keep logs of all the animals coming in and out of the building. What happens to them? Ordering of supplies, um, helping with typing court cases, bills, things like that. That is really an important position that we really do need um, the help with. I'm asking for five additional animal control officers. Not only would that make sure that we have adequate service and we can then branch into areas again. 
In the past, we had enough officers that we had them broken into areas in the county. So that way, there wasn't an animal waiting a long time or law enforcement waiting a long time. Right now, sometimes our officers are on the other side of the county, and they might be waiting a half hour before they can even clear their call to get over there. Um, and that also includes we had to eliminate our second shift years ago. That would include us bringing back a second shift. And a second shift is so very important, I'm going to tell you, especially during the summer. During the summer, it's lighter longer. We have kids out playing on the streets and dogs out roaming. So I think that's great that we would be able to bring back second shift. And again, animals that are injured later in the day, it's up to police or a citizen to bring them into the drop-off room or take them to the animal emergency clinic. So that would make someone available to help those injured animals later in the day. We're requesting two additional kennel attendants. That would mean we've always had two people um, back there to tend to the animals, and in addition, when we're slower up front, those people can go in the back and help. So I think that's a, a big addition. I'll not only help keep the kennels cleaner, but maybe we can do some more progressive things with the animals. At this time, we just don't have the, the time. <coughs> Here is a general a description of our volunteer events coordinator. Um, that's the first sheet, and that will be posted if it is approved. It's the first half of it. Um, and as you can see, it coordinates the volunteer program, um, takes applications, does volunteers orientation. I think that will make a, a good difference when you interview a volunteer. You can find out what their interests are and I think that will help maintain volunteers if you can direct them to the area of their interest. At this point, we have to rely on other volunteers being in the building and, and helping them find a buddy to volunteer. So this way we can help direct them to the area of their interest. And there's the required knowledge, skills, and abilities that we're requesting. And here is the job description for the animal control specialist. Um, and as you can see, handles complaints from the, com from the county, um, performs duties of an officer when directed, um, an expert animal cruelty investigation, works with the seasonal employees with the census program during the summer, um, and represents the county. And there's the second half of required knowledge, skills, and abilities. And then this is a flow chart for the positions that we are asking for. As you can see, it's broken down to administration, the shelter, and then enforcement. And improving staffing will make a, a difference. If we have an adequate amount of staffing, we can not only tend to the animals properly and to the calls, we can then continue to send people for further training. At this time, we don't have enough staff to cover anybody to go for training. There are workshops and everything going on every day, training for staff to improve and new technology out there to help with placing the animals and catching them on the streets. But unfortunately, at this time, we have nobody to cover for them to send them to these seminars. And that includes for myself. And I think with adequate staffing, there's less stress. We can take care of the animals better, make the public happy, and it makes for a better employee. And in a better employee, you get more work out of them and a better environment for the public and animals. And of course, we can't forget the things that we need done to the building. Um, again, our building is considered adequate, but let's face, we need to move it forward. Um, we are looking at different vehicle cage fittings. At this time, we only have vans for the road. It has been brought up before that we actually need a truck. What happens during the bad weather, I don't know if anybody's driven these vans, but vans are horrible in bad weather. And then on top of it, these cages are all on one side of the van. So what happens when the weather gets really bad and it's deep and roads do not get plowed or tended to on the side streets, our vehicles cannot make it to those calls. They either have to hike it on foot or ask the person to meet them. So we are looking into possibly um, getting a truck and that does not come out of our budget, but we would need to look at vehicle cage fittings for that. Um, a proper ventilation system, um, we like to call some people in and update that system. As we all know, we've had numerous complaints about that. We'd like to change one of our sections actually into a dog run area. Um, at this time, we actually have five dog runs in the back, and they are the poorest and adequate dog runs um, you can imagine. 
they're hard to keep clean, they're hard to get the animals in and out of. Um, our role, and I believe in the packet, you'll see a picture of humane side these dog runs. Those are dog runs, they might cost more to build, but they last forever. And there's also a guillotine door. So unlike the cages we have now, where we have to pull them out, move them, or it takes two people to do it, we'll be able to shut them onto the other side of the run. And it's less stress for the animal too, not having to be moved. And it'll give the animals more exercise. Because as of right now, we only have five, and we try to use those for the court case animals that we're holding long term. And unfortunately, we have more court case animals at this time than we do runs. Um, lighting for the building, for the interior. I don't know if any, how many of you come in on a regular basis, but some days it is so dark and dreary in there, even with the lights on. So we'd like to improve our lighting system and for emergency lighting. At this time, in order if we're broken into at night, which unfortunately does happen, we either have to leave the lights on so the video footage can get the picture of what is happening, or if we turn the lights off to save money, there's no footage. It's pitch dark. So that, that's a problem. So if we could get emergency lighting where it comes on, we're going to save on our bills. Um, lighting for the exterior of the building. Um, it is pretty dark out there at night, even when the lights are on. Sometimes I leave there at night and it's pretty scary. Not only do you have to worry about what animals are out there or people, but now with this weather, trying to walk your way to the car without hitting a nice slick. So um, that lighting would be very important for everybody's safety. Um, painting the interior. Um, let's face it, the inside of our building does look like a that called a prison, but we do need some updated um, painting to make it more friendlier. And on top of that, it is due. We are starting to have some peeling and flaking, which is something we do need to take care of. Um, we also need observation and secure, more security cameras for interior and exterior. Um, we do have people that break into the buildings. When you're housing dogs from a fight or from a drug raid, People do hit, break in through those windows to come get their animals. And unfortunately at this time, we don't have enough cameras to surround the whole building. Um, so that is important, needed, and inside too. Um, it's for everybody's safety. And the walkways. Um, as the dog walkers will tell you, our walkways are a little uneven out there, and including the front of our building. So I think long term for safety wise, we need to update, update those. And of course, those are the major things. We are also, you know, talking about other things. We've talked about, like in the past, we've had a cat nursery area. At this point, we don't have a kitten nursery because of the staffing shortage. It's been brought up. We also need to break up to put puppies and smaller dogs in their own sections. And I agree, those are great things to look at. But at this time, till we have the staffing to do it. Um, and here's a picture, I'm sure everyone's been to the Humane Society. This is a general idea of the kind of runs we're talking about. These runs aren't cheap, but they do last forever. Um, I do think for us, though, this is a picture of their atrium. And in their atrium, you'll see the cement only goes up halfway, and the rest is fencing. They generally only put the, like, the smaller animals or the animals in there that we know aren't going to have any more issues with other dogs. The rest of their runs are solid walls in their run area and that's what we'd be looking at because let's face it the majority of the dogs we get in are intact so we have issues of maybe fighting with our neighbors over food possessions or or the girl next door and disease yes thank you doc um from problem to problems we solved we move from inadequate service to public quality service i feel calls every day from people and i understand their frustration i'd be mad too Back in the day, I've called and asked for help, too. And, and it is hard when you have to explain to someone, I understand you're afraid of this dog running on your street, but unfortunately, I don't have anyone to get there. Or at the time we are able to get to it, at the end of the day, the dog is gone. So we can help try to resolve some of these problems before it does turn into this dog actually biting somebody. Um, move from an adequate, okay, facility to moving up with improvements to make the animals more comfortable, especially for the long term ones we have to hold for, for legal reasons. Um, and these problems will take time to resolve. These aren't going to happen overnight. But the sooner we move forward, the sooner we can move forward with this and, and get going and help make a difference for the public and for the animals. Any questions? I have one to start with, Stephanie. Yes, sir. Thank you for the presentation. Um, 
Is there any uh, feelings about the veterinary services contract we have now? Is that adequate to moving forward? Um, it would be great if we could do a little more, I, and I don't mean it as an insult to our vet, because our vet actually donates more of our service than we actually pay her for it. So actually, it's the best service we've ever had. Is that $15,000 a year or something? something yeah, and I do think we need to look at that more long term. Right now, you guys did award us some money to use for spay and neuters. We are using it, but it's fairly because, again, we have to be able to get the animals there and pick them up. And we have to take them in the morning. And that is difficult because those same officers are cleaning as they're cleaning, 911's calling for assistance. So that can cause a problem of us getting done cleaning in the morning. So that is why sometimes we, we're only going like once a week for spay and neuters. We do have that money available. So with proper staffing, we can use that money. And the goal is to make sure that, you know, the dogs are also getting altered. At this time, the majority of our cats are done due to the kindness of our vet. And again, once we get that rolling, there is all sorts of, you know, grants and such to continue getting the animals um, altered. Committee questions? Anyone from the committee? Commissioner Adams? I noticed on your sheet in the packet you also list a sound system update of the system. Oh, yes. And I wondered, uh, that, could you talk a little bit about the kinds of problems that would address? I know there's that free uh, music program yes. to soothe the dogs, but I wondered. Yeah, you know, and it was recommended by one of our volunteers, which I think is a great idea, the sound system to soothe the animals. The problem is at this time our PA system it's a flip of the coin whether it's going to work that day. Sometimes we need to page a staff person. We try to use it at work. Sometimes it doesn't work. So we did have it looked at. We do have an estimate on how much it would cost to update the system. And not only for safety, it's for human communication, but that would allow us also to use play the sound system for the animals. I know that time I looked at it, I couldn't believe that thing must have been there for 30 years. It's, it's been a long time, apparently. Came with the building. So it's more than 30 years. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess that's all I have. Anyone else from the committee have any questions? Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, first off, I'd like to welcome the public. Appreciate you showing up here on a Wednesday morning. At this time, we set aside for public comment. Hi, Terry. Yes. Um, I didn't know you were ready to entertain a motion, but I moved that the committee approve the the expenditure of uh, funds for these positions and the proof of the proposed plan. Everyone understand the motion? Is there support? Uh, I support it, but I have a question. Yes. Uh, is there something in here on the total cost of what we're proposing to do? Uh, is that what you're uh, for? Me and the other pack. Yes, it's in your packet. Oh, okay. It's about the third page in. I see. That contains what she's asking for right now is the staffing because in order to move forward with the, the actual mm -hmm. uh, physical improvements, she had to get the bids and so forth. So that's not exactly the question. So let me rephrase the motion uh, that the committee approve for recommendations for staffing. Support. So it's going to be supported. Uh, obviously, your motion is considering moving this forward as fast as we can move forward. Yes, I mean, we'll move it. You know, we move that to the next committee. Just so the committee understands, presently the general fund budget of the county funds that we down control for somewhere around 500 so I guess what I'm saying is when we say there's not money available yet because of the collection of millage that was so graciously received I think there is money there so well yeah because we're at the, the end of the year that's going to be coming in and it's going to take time once she posts positions that's they are probably going to be a higher rate of growth time factor and actually, actually higher personnel staff and going through the background checks, going through all the necessities that HR does. And based on that, HR have anything they'd like to add to the No? Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? 
Let's have a roll call, please. 